neighbor, and welcome to episode seven of the Neighborhood Money Podcast, a video podcast here to help you build your financial knowledge and help you build a life you deserve. We are back in the Neighborhood Studio. I am one of your co-hosts. I'm Kevin. And I'm Drew. In today's episode, we're going to talk all about the 10 of the worst credit card mistakes to avoid, which is an article that we found from bankrate.com. Later on in the episode, we also are going to dive into an excellent neighborhood question that's all about mutual fund expense ratios. And definitely stick around to the end where Drew and I both share what's going on in our neighborhood. Yeah, I did a little whoopsie with my pregnant wife. <laughs> Oh, you'll <laughs> hear that a little bit later on in the episode. Sounds like you got a confession to make here to the neighbors. Just a little bit. <laughs> if you want to continue to support this podcast, there's really a few ways that you can do so. The first being you can share this episode with one friend or family member. That definitely helps us grow our reach and gets it into more ears. If you listen to the audio version of this podcast, please rate and review on whatever podcast platform you're listening on, as that also helps us grow our podcast. And if you're watching the video version of this podcast over on YouTube, be sure to subscribe to our channel, as well as you can hit the notification bell to be notified when we launch any new videos and like this video if you find value in it. Let us know in the reviews or comments what you want to hear from us and uh, we'd love to do episodes on what you want to hear. And then lastly, you can find us on all social medias or at least the major social media accounts. So we're on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. We'll try to put out little tidbits here and there on Instagram to either summarize our episodes or give some cool statistics or even show some reviews on on there as well. So Drew, before we dive in here to the top 10 mistakes to avoid, let's have a quick word from one of our neighbors. So the neighbor we have this week is Sam Stocks. I will try to read this without messing it up. <laughs> <laughs> And he says, keep up the awesome videos, guys. It was small creators like yourself that inspired me to start a YouTube channel of my own. Keep up the fantastic work. Looking forward to your future content. Well, Sam, we appreciate the, the comment and the review from YouTube. And, you know, we went on and we watched one of your episodes, your most recent one about inflation. I want to say it was good content. You're able to squeeze a lot of information in on a very short amount of period of time. I think it was less than five minutes. And I just want say that your graphics look awesome so thanks again for the review and Sorry, I just butchered re <laughs> reading your comment. Not one and of by the traits. And by the sound of your accent, it sounds like we officially have a neighbor from across the big pond. Oh, yeah. All right. So in our main segment here today, we have an excellent article from Bankrate titled 10 Credit Card Mistakes to Avoid. Drew, this article is written by Anna Staples, and I think it's a really good list for our neighbors to be aware of and to really think through when they are either shopping for a credit card or currently using a credit card and using debt in their financial financial life. Yeah, I think when we've looked back and talked on credit cards ourselves, we've came up with things that we've liked to avoid. And as of just doing some more research and reading more articles, we thought this bank rate one just was a good summary of our top 10 that we even thought were a big ones as well. Definitely. So Anna starts out the article with number one being paying late on your credit card. So number one thing you want to avoid. She says late payments are some of the worst things that can happen to your credit. They stay on your credit report for seven years. That's a long time to pay for a credit card mistake. Yeah, these late payments are kind of ones that they don't seem like a big deal with them just being a small dollar amount on some of the times, but it is something that will affect your credit score in the future. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a couple things that you can do to potentially try to avoid those, whether it be notifications or if it ends up being a weird part in the month of where you actually have to pay it, sometimes you can reach out to your credit card company and just say, hey, is there any chance we can move this statement date to a different date? And there's a lot mm -hmm. of times where they do work with you on that. That's a really good point. Really align it with how you're getting paid. But I even think before you even get to there, always make sure that when you're using credit cards, you have the money in the bank and you can afford to pay your credit card off as soon as you make the purchase. I think that's a really good way to avoid paying late due to the fact of having insufficient funds. And just a small other little tidbit about the late payments is it takes 30 days before it gets sent off to these credit bureaus. So so mm -hmm. if you pay that late payment within that 30 days, you still get the fee from your credit card company, but it's not going to be something that's going to be potentially affecting your credit score. To further it out, it is for these late payments. 
is just the more it affects your credit score. And the more interest that you're going to pay and late Correct. fees that you're going to pay without paying it on time. So Anna dives into number two saying you want to avoid making only minimum payments. She says, however, paying only the minimum amount due is also a sure way to bear yourself in credit card debt for a long time, especially if you're running balances in thousands of dollars. And these minimum payments can sneak up on to you and just make sure you're not looking at these minimum payments as just a monthly expense. These mm -hmm. are these are going to be increasing as your statement increases and if you're not paying down these debts and by the end of the year by the end of two three years down the road you might have this credit card maxed out and you've been saying hey but i've been paying my minimum payments why that mm -hmm. why is my balance so high and it's because you're right. not paying down any of that principal more or less it's you're paying mm -hmm. down in, you're just paying interest and you're not even really paying the full interest amount the way credit card companies really make their money is they have a very small minimum payment and then mm -hmm. if you're not aware of of the fact that you should be paying more, just paying the minimum payment is going to very quickly increase the balance on that card. The more or the longer you continue to make those minimum payments, the higher that balance is going to be and the harder it's going to be to get out of debt. Yeah, I think that leads into the next topic in this top 10 is for the number three is they're running high balances. Yeah, so Anna says it's also a bad idea to carry a high balance or max out your card and not just because of expensive interest charges. So we really talked about having a high balance, yeah. going to lead to high interest rates or high interest rate charges. Essentially, it's going to be a higher expense to you and it's going to be really hard to get out of debt. But there's yep. also another thing to consider when you're running a high balance on your credit card. Yep. And that would be, at least if you, this is what you're alluding towards, is the utilization right. of this credit card. And a way to think about this is say your max was $1,000 on your credit card limit and you have a balance of $300. That's giving you that 30% utilization mark. And mm -hmm. the higher that utilization means the closer you are to the max of your credit limit. And then that just start looking, looking more poor on your credit score. Yep. The utilization rate, you really want to keep that low. And so when you do have those high balances, that's going to decrease your credit score. One myth to really avoid is you don't really want to have a rolling balance on your credit card. You do hear from time to time that it's important to have a balance on your credit card because it does improve your credit score. That's actually not true. Having a balance on your credit card is ultimately going to lead to higher interest rate charges as well as higher utilization rates, which could negatively impact your credit score. That's that's all a very good point with those utilization rates. And if you're thinking about somebody that has a really good credit score rating, this is something where they may have that 7 to 10% utilization rate is kind of where people like to put it towards. Mm -hmm. And this utilization rate, it's at the statement balance date. Like when right. your statement ends, that's where it happens. So if you're paying all this money off before your statement comes out, your utilization will be lower. If you're paying out the statement date, that's what's going to be sent off and showing what your final amount is. I think it's a really important point to make is that even beyond your credit card balances that you have, you have to also account into other debts that you may have because all of that when you think about your credit score is going to impact what your score is from these credit score companies. So that brings us to number four in this top 10 list, not keeping an eye on transactions. So Anna again states that if you see a charge that you know you haven't made, it can be a sign of fraudulent activity, which can get very expensive to ignore. Yeah, I have to admit, I'm not the best at this mistake. <laughs> I, I don't avoid it all the times. So luckily, I haven't had any issues with fraud with my credit card, but but I'm not the best at looking line by line on my credit card statement. Mm -hmm. It's something I'm trying to get better at. And it's also a nice area where I use that mint for. So when I look at my mint account, I can see my transactions. I see how they get into my budget. And if any email alerts that are, I get email alerts if anything's out of the ordinary. And luckily I haven't gotten any of those yet. I'm definitely on the opposite end of the spectrum. I constantly <laughs> look at my credit card throughout the month. And actually I don't even look at the statement because I just look at it so frequently. And mm -hmm. so I have definitely caught fraudulent activity on credit cards and I've reported it, you know, as soon as it happens. And so it really brings us to a good point around credit cards. Typically all credit cards will provide fraud protection. It's a law and you have up to 60 days to report any fraudulent activity on your credit card and you won't be charged. The issue is when you get into beyond those 60 days, you're no longer protected by regulation and you might have to work more closely with your credit card company to potentially get that covered by the credit card company. 
or the merchant, depending on what type of fraudulent activity there is. So when you've caught the fraudulent activity in the past, has it been on mm-hmm. smaller dollar amounts where maybe a restaurant overcharges you or has it been completely out of the ordinary transaction? I forget exactly what the transaction was, but it was definitely out of the ordinary. I want to say it was five, six, seven hundred dollars. There was a couple of them one morning. Oh, so pretty and large so- amount. It was easy to spot, but I will mm-hmm. also say I've seen charges of one to ten dollars on my credit card from an unknown vendor, yeah. and I've questioned it and talking with my wife, making sure mm-hmm. that hey, did we actually spend our money here? Let's rethink what we did. And at the end of the day, we always come back to yes, we did spend the money, but you got to be make sure that you could see either small charges, which I haven't personally seen on my accounts. Or those larger charges that are easier to spot, which I unfortunately did have the opportunity to go through that process. Yeah. But it definitely made it easier to spot having the higher charge. Yeah. And I have to say, as much as like I'm not the best at that, when I was talking about having that mint, when I do go back and categorize, if because some things are out of categorized, because I will say, hey, your budget's way over. I'm like, that doesn't make sense. So when I go and recategorize, if it's a name I'm not familiar with, I do go back and mm-hmm. search and say, what the, what was that? I can't remember paying exactly what that was. And then I'd be, mm-hmm. oh, that's what it is. And then I'll write a note in there. So if I see it in the future, I have an idea. It's always good to look back. And that also helps you with your budgeting, making sure that you know where you're spending your money. So number five on this list here is not knowing what your credit card terms are. She states, the fine print will give you an idea of introductory rates, balance transfer fees, and other kinds of charges you can expect in certain cases. These credit card terms kind of go back towards those minimum payments and these running these high balances where if you don't understand what your interest rates are, you're spending mm-hmm. a lot of money. So for my, I have two credit cards and one mm-hmm. of them is about 23% and the other is about 25%. Mm-hmm. So if you're looking at your, I mean, the loans now to get a house or a vehicle, I mean, you're look, you're getting stuff, even if you have bad credit, probably under 5%, you know, and right. that's being on the high end. Mm-hmm. So when you're thinking 23 to 25% interest, that's a lot of money that you'd be spending on your pay. Right, right. You had to put that into dollars. For every hundred dollars you have out in debt, credit card debt, you're going to be paying 23 to 25 dollars of interest. Yeah. And even beyond your annual interest rate or your APY, so your annual percentage yield, if you hear that, there are certain credit card terms that you need to be aware of. So for example, we talked a little bit about penalties if you pay late. Mm-hmm. Some credit cards will actually increase your APY if you are late. So you definitely need to be aware of that. Just to add on to that sometimes you may open up a credit card just because they have a good interest rate or they have a good perk for if you spend x amount of dollars in a certain time frame that's when you also want to make sure you know what that time frame is so if you're carrying this balance because you think it's zero percent mm-hmm. and then you don't understand when that date ends and it hits you're going to be pretty unhappy with that charge that's an excellent point to call out a lot of these credit cards say zero percent apy or 0% interest rate if you transfer over to that card, you know, any other credit card debt that you might have. Mm -hmm. But what happens beyond that initial term, you definitely need to be aware of that because your interest rate could, you know, jump up even beyond the 25%, depending on what the deal is and what your credit score looks like. Yeah. So number six on this list is choosing a card that doesn't fit your lifestyle. Not all credit cards are created equal as they serve different financial goals. If you're getting a new card, I recommend diving into research to find the best option. Anna wrote in this article, I think this is a really good point in that you can find credit cards that ultimately fit your lifestyle and help you get rewards just by doing everything that you do on a day-to-day basis. For me, I wasn't really sure what credit cards were or how they worked until I was 22 or 23 when I started my first job at an accounting firm. And I had to get one for the traveling. And that was when I had to do some research in and ask the people about me, hey, what am what am I spending this on? You know, what are good cards you guys like to use. And from Mm -hmm. doing that, it was a good way to go do that research and find out I want a credit card that is going to give me good points or cash back for restaurants and hotels and travel. You have your travel cards. You have your cards that give you cash back on groceries and gas. You also Mm -hmm. have credit cards for specific stores. I know, you know, the Apple credit card will give you a certain percent back when you're buying Apple products. So really, ultimately, you just need to decide how does my lifestyle point to a specific type of credit card that can best fit it. I think a really good and important part of that, though, is don't pick a credit card. Let's just say, for example, for traveling because you travel and then spend more on travel than you normally (laughs) would. 
because then you're not going to ultimately get the benefits because you're going to be overspending and you're going to ultimately have a higher chance of getting into credit card debt and starting to get into that cycle. And I think that really brings yeah. us into the number seven on the list here, Drew, is overspending on your credit card. So she wrote again, another easy way to overspend is chasing rewards. Earning rewards should be about getting something extra while you're doing your normal shopping. That overspending one is goes into a couple things, at least in my mind, that triggers it is for one, it's much easier to just go and say, oh, I can purchase it now and I'll just kind of deal with it later. It's a lot easier to do that. Mm -hmm. It's not dollar bills coming out of your pocket. It's just a quick swipe, which makes it even more easy. Right. And then the third part is it's kind of goes hand in hand with the section above with knowing which card because if you're overspending and then you have this annual fee at the end of the at the end of mm -hmm. the year, yeah. those perks that you initially got into that credit card are just worthless. It's, it's right. why would you even get into it? It just hurt you more than it helped you, which was your initial thought of getting into it. You need to make sure that the rewards far outweigh what those annual fees are for the card that you specifically use or choose to use. I think it's really easy to overspend when you are using plastic. I know when I think back of when my family was trying to get out of student loan debt, mm -hmm. we obviously had credit cards and we continue to use credit cards to this day. But when we started really looking at our finances and getting onto a budget, we were like, hey, wow, we were spending a lot of money through our credit cards mm -hmm. on really things that we ultimately didn't really find all that much valuable to our life. And so just be very cognizant of using plastic because you really don't get that pain factor, right? That no, pain you don't. factor when you spend cash and you hand over those dollar bills, just a quick swipe of a card or even now it's just, you know, a tap of your phone or a tap of your card. It's really easy to overspend when you're using plastic. That's for sure. I know when I have cash in my wallet, it stays in there for quite a bit, you know, pretty long time mm -hmm. because anytime I'm potentially wanting to buy something, I go, do I really want to buy it? I mean, I have to take this cash <laughs> and hand it over. It's not going to be my wallet. I don't get to look at it anymore. Kind of like mm -hmm. looking at the cash. And right. if I don't have any cash in there, it's just almost, uh, oh, I got a credit card. You can just swipe that. <laughs> and it's definitely easy to continue to swipe. This is an area where you kind of have to realize that the credit card companies, they are trying to make their money mm -hmm. and they know that it's easier to swipe. And when they try going and targeting younger people that maybe aren't as educated on it or ha are living a lifestyle where it's out and about and trying to keep up with friends, you can get yourself into a lot of debt thinking, oh yeah, I have all this money I can spend, even though you don't bring that money in. Right. And number eight on the list here is applying for too many credit cards at once. So she writes, each card application triggers a hard inquiry, which can knock a few points off of your credit score. To my understanding, the hard inquiry is just when they go and double check your credit and actually really look in and deep dive into into your mm -hmm. credit and it kind of gives them saying hey we have to do a lot more work to see if you're approved for this so it's going to affect your credit score it's the credit card company or whoever you're taking debt out with they're going into your credit report credit history and it's mm -hmm. different than a soft inquiry where a soft inquiry is where you would go out and look at your credit score and your credit report. That doesn't impact your credit score at all. The hard inquiries do. And so when you're thinking about taking on more credit cards, the more hard inquiries you have, meaning the more credit cards you apply for, the more of those hard inquiries you're going to have and the more your credit score will get impacted and ultimately decrease. And another thing with these credit card companies is when they do these hard inquiries and they look and say you have, oh, this person's doing like five or 10 and they're all drawn into credit cards, that's a trigger in their mind thinking you're in some type of financial distress. You're trying to get as much mm -hmm. lines of credit as you can, and you're going to max them out and not pay them off. You're either not going to get accepted or yep. you're going to have a higher interest rate. Yep. A really good general rule of thumb when you're thinking about applying for different credit cards is only apply for one credit card per year. Now, me personally, I only have one credit card and my wife has one credit card. So we ultimately only have two credit cards as a family that we use. And so we don't go out and search for credit cards. But if you want to get into the reward system, or you're thinking, you know, maybe you need a travel card now because you're starting to travel. Just be cognizant mm -hmm. that a really good general rule of thumb is only to apply for one credit card per year. I don't. I mean, I had one credit card since, or like it's, we're talking about that first job, I've had that same credit card. And this was the first year since then that I've actually gone out for another credit card. And that was just because I know I had a kitchen remodel coming up and I could put money on to that credit card and get mm -hmm. some good perks for traveling. Mm -hmm. We're going on a vacation, uh, I think, in was it end of February or March. And all these perks that from that credit card 
of expenses I'm already paying for is going to pay for the trip for us. Yeah, that's an excellent way to use credit cards. I know we did the same thing for a wedding. You know, we had these big wedding expenses. Mm -hmm. We were going to go on a honeymoon. We got a travel card for it and we ultimately got a free honeymoon out of the deal. So it can be a really good way to use credit cards to get those rewards. But again, don't Keep go and overspend. So Drew, you saying that you've had a credit card for a very long time. I have as well. I think that really gives us a natural segue into number nine on the list here, which is canceling a credit card. And so you ultimately don't really want to go out and just cancel all the credit cards that you're not using because that could potentially impact your utilization rate. Yeah, there's also a credit history side of it as well. So sure. if you've had this credit card, like I said, for say like over five years, and this new credit card I just got is less than one year old, if, if I were to cancel my other credit card, it would show I really only have like one year credit history in the credit mm -hmm. card realm, that is. I mean, I've had some credit in some other areas too, but that's one thing when you're canceling these credit cards, it potentially affects your hit credit history and they don't think you're as loyal or, mm -hmm. you know. A big thing that goes into your credit report or credit score is that history. So when you do cancel those long-term credit cards that you have out, it's going to shrink the amount of debt duration that you've had on your personal account and that's going to ultimately impact it, like Drew was just saying. And then Drew, to really wrap up here for number Number 10 mm -hmm. on this article from Bankrate is not requesting credit limit increases. So she states, higher credit limits bring lower credit utilization. Given your spending stays the same, I recommend requesting a credit limit increase for each of your cards once a year, unless your credit card issuer increases your credit line automatically. What do you think about increasing your credit limit? Increasing the credit limit, I think, is a very good thing that you should be doing on almost that annual basis. And it goes back to that utilization rate. So if you're having, like we said, that $1,000 and you had $300 on it, you're having that 30% utilization rate. Well, now if you were to bump that up every year to 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, but you still carry that same $300, mm -hmm. it looks like you're using way less of your credit limit which ends up showing as a positive to your credit score and the credit bureaus. That's going to ultimately help you in things like getting approved for a mortgage. So to buy a house, mm -hmm. maybe you want to get into the rental property space. It's going to help you get approved for that type of loan or even other big purchases like a car, you know, things like that. Having that higher credit limit, which leads to the lower utilization rate is going to really help your credit report and credit score. Yeah. Just remember to be disciplined. Just because you have a higher right. limit doesn't mean you're going to spend more. That is an excellent point. You don't want to continue to spend just because you have the opportunity to. You definitely want to keep your spending the same. Just increase that credit limit and you're going to see improvements on your credit score. So that really sums up the top 10 credit card mistakes to avoid. Drew, what are some of the key takeaways that you took from this article? Looking at the top 10 and talking through, going through this episode, for me, my takeaway is you have to remember that these credit card companies, they're in the business to make money, and mm -hmm. they know it's easy for people to swipe. It's You're not emotionally attached to your money as much as you would be if you're handing over with a cash or some. Mm -hmm you know, some type of dollar bills. So I think that's like the biggest thing is you just want to be disciplined. You don't want to make or overspend. And I guess my, my thoughts of that. So just remember if they're in it to make money right. and don't fall into their trap and use it to your advantage. I think that overspending for me is a, you know, a really big takeaway. Credit card can be definitely a very useful tool in your financial life. One for building credit, it's definitely easier to purchase things. And you also get that added protection from fraudsters mm -hmm. and you know, the perks of getting rewards is big, but you got, need to make sure that you are keeping your spending normal and not increasing your spending because you do have this, you know, line of credit at the end of the day available to you. So yeah, you definitely want to be responsible. And you know, the last thing that I would really say is just avoid interest at all costs, pay mm -hmm. off your entire balance each and every month and don't pay interest to the credit card companies. Just take the rewards that they're going to give you. I would say use the credit cards as a tool and don't use them mm -hmm. as a crutch. Put yourself in a good financial position. Again, this mm -hmm. goes back to building out an emergency fund so that if you do get into a predicament where you do need to make or you do need to have some money on hand to pay for something, you can hit up that emergency fund rather than going to a line of credit. Yeah. Now, I know there are situations you know, where people do have to go uh, and find credit cards to pay for things. And if you are in that situation, I would just say that make a plan and try to get your credit card paid off as fast as you can so you're not paying that you know, 23 to 25% 
on the balance each and every year. Great point. So, Drew, do we have any questions from the neighborhood this week? We do. Uh, we have a question. I'll read it here from our neighbor, Nate. And he's asking, I was looking at what to invest in with my Roth today. And I just saw your Instagram post on expense ratios. I'm aware of them, but I'm curious what you think is an acceptable rate for a risky fund. As I'm young, I'm wanting to grow now and be more conservative later. So I found a fund that I like a lot with a history of great returns, but has a high expense ratio of 1.28%. Curious what your thoughts are on it because it's high, but they've shown great returns over the years. Thanks for the question, Nate. The first thing we need to talk about is what is an expense ratio? So you're going to see these in your retirement accounts, whether you have a 401k, 403b, or you have an individual retirement account, an IRA, whether that's Roth or traditional, and you're investing in mutual funds. An expense ratio ultimately is the operating cost of a mutual fund because it is actively managed by whether it's an investment manager or an advisor. And that's mm -hmm. ultimately, or at least the majority of what that expense ratio goes towards. And so it's a way to keep the fund operating. It's a way for the people that are managing the fund to make money and to continue to provide this service to you in your retirement account. I think for these expense ratios and kind of go off of what that question is, you know, something as he brought up a good point is it's a higher expense ratio than he has. And what was it you're saying, Kevin? A good one is about 0.5 to 0.75% expense ratio. That's generally what they say in the industry is when you're looking at these mutual funds, actively managed funds, yeah, that half percent to the three quarter percent expense ratio is pretty decent. So I think going back to that, now this is just our opinion. It's not advice by any mm -hmm. means. If I were to be in something along those lines, I don't mind the risk. And depending on how much money you have in this account, maybe that percentage isn't affecting you a lot. So hopefully these returns outweigh that expense. So then you can always change that in the future. Now, one thing to really consider and just to be aware of this expense ratio is going to be taken out whether your account goes up, grows in yeah. value, or it goes down. So you're always going to be paying the fee regardless of the return that you see in your account. Yeah, that's a good point. And then lastly, I think that the only thing you really need to think about when you're looking at these expense ratios, typically a higher expense ratio means the fund is more actively managed, which typically leads to taking on more risk. I know personally for me, I really like index funds. They're low fee, low expense ratio, mutual funds, but you really need to decide where you are in your financial journey. So maybe you are younger and you can take on more risk and these expense ratios aren't really that big of a deal right now because you really anticipate this fund to outperform the market and really give you higher returns. So I just think it's really important to just make that plan. And if this type of fund fits into it, that's excellent. Yeah, I hope that answers your question, Nate. But if you have any more <laughs> questions, I'll reach out and we'll be more than willing to put more of our two cents in. All right, Drew, our favorite segment of the episode is what's going on in your neighborhood. If you're new to the podcast, this is really just a segment where Drew and I share what's gone on in the last week in each of our lives. And sometimes it's financially related. Typically it's not, but it's really a good chance for us to share with you a little bit more about our personal lives and for you to get to know us a little bit better. So Drew, what's going on in your neighborhood? Oh, I don't know if I even want to tell. <laughs> I, know I think I you did have some confessions to make here. <laughs> I did allude to it earlier on in the episode. So here it comes. So <laughs> my pregnant wife was sitting on the couch and I went up, ordered myself a drink. And then she goes, you know what? She's like, is there any more of those NA beers in there? Those non-alcoholics? I was like, yeah, I I think there's she's like, oh, you want to pour me one? I said, sure, I can go do that. <laughs> I go into the fridge. I grab the NA. I pour it into the glass and I bring it over to her. And she takes one sip and goes, oh, this is just hitting the spot right now. <laughs> and then she goes, it's almost hitting the spot too good. And then she's like, what can did you put in here? I'm like, some the, yellow non <laughs> the yellow non-alcoholic one, the one you asked for. She went up and looked and apparently it was a cider with <laughs> alcohol in it. <laughs> But she only took one small little taste, so it's not too big of a deal, but we were cracking up pretty good about it. She goes, you almost made me accidentally drink a full beer. <laughs> well, more props to her for knowing that, hey, this doesn't feel right after just one sip. Yeah, I hope that's by her doing that, it's not showing that she doesn't quite trust me enough. <laughs> But if she did it, I mean, that's probably good, good reason because she was right on that one. 
that might be the underlying factor here, Drew. But I, you know, <laughs> I might, I must mess up a lot. <laughs> so how about you? What did uh, you have going on in your neighborhood? So this past week, my brother and his fiance moved to their new townhouse, and so. We've been over there and helping them out a little bit, helping them move in and get situated. Okay. Uh, but the coolest thing is that my brother got a kegerator for a housewarming present. And Ew. let me tell you, the kegerator is probably one of the coolest things I've ever seen. A kegerator is exactly what it sounds like. It is a refrigerator that holds a keg and you have tap beer at all times. Those are pretty nice and it's... For some reason, it looks like your neighborhood and my neighborhood had the same type of <laughs> themes this week. <laughs> I guess so. It was a beer drinking theme so in the you neighborhood. So you're able to move a lot of the furniture and then you get paid with beer. That's not too shabby. To be you know, fully transparent, I did not move any of the furniture, <laughs> but I did help install some of their light fixtures. So I wasn't... Yeah, huge amount of help, but I still was paid in some keg beer. Yeah, um, and you deserve that one. That. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely a very cool thing to have at hand. Um, and I, I'll probably have to give my brother and his fiance a couple of cakes here. Yeah, well, I think those are some pretty good things that happen in our neighborhood. People, please don't judge me too much on accidentally giving <laughs> my pregnant wife a beer. But that's just, uh, we caught it early. We caught it early. That's all that Outs- matters. Outside of that, that really wraps up this week's episode on top. Top 10 credit card mistakes to avoid. I thought the top 10 out of that bank rate article, I thought were great. They really hit on those top, you know, items that you really want to think about. And I hope you guys enjoyed what we had to say on that episode. Is there anything you guys wanted to add? We'd love for you to add that. And if you're listening on a review, if you're watching this on YouTube and seeing our pretty faces, <laughs> you can leave a comment down below. That's a stretch. <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit of a stretch. Yeah. Outside of that, like we said earlier, we are on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Come check us out. We'd love your support there. Outside of that, that's wrapping up this week in the neighborhood. So we will see you next week in the neighborhood. Bye.